Today we are going to be uh, hearing from uh, Zona Zaric, who is a former graduate of the American University of Paris and Masters of the Army, for a good has gone on to, the, uh, to a PhD, which she's finishing now, at the École du Normale Supérieure in Paris, which is the, an elite institution in the philosophy department there where she's completing a thesis now on the politics of compassion. I believe the title of that thesis is going to change. It's a cosmopolitan thesis, a thesis oriented on, on cosmopolitan ethics and cosmopolitan morals and cosmopolitan political philosophy. Ms. Uh, um, uh, uh, Zarich is much more of a cosmopolitan than I am. I'm a thin cosmopolitan. She's more of a thick cosmopolitan. But they, there's lots of room here for the bed. Huh? So, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. Uh, no, I know it's a stressful period, finals, exam papers. I hope you had some time to take a look at the readings. If not, uh, just uh, the reason I sent them to you is uh, to get some sort of introduction so that we could also have a dialogue. I don't want to be speaking and not giving you what you want to hear or not being interesting enough, so feel free to interrupt me with a question at any time and uh, I don't know if you've already started thinking and talking about cosmopolitanism in previous classes but um, if I remember kind of the framework of the class I know what, what you've uh, talked about so far so um, I've been asked to talk to you today about cosmopolitanism but also in the current context in addressing uh, the current crises which is the one of uh, refugees or the environment and how that pertains uh, to thinking uh, the world in a cosmopolitan framework. Sorry, we're just having a little trouble hearing you. Oh, sorry, I always speak to, oh, yeah. Okay, tell me, or if you want to come closer, maybe. I'll try, here, I'll try and project my voice. I've been trying to do that since a long time. I, I do try to encourage people to think that they're in theater and to boom their voices when they speak. We don't all have that gift. But working on it. Okay, thanks. Thanks for letting me know. So, um, just uh, briefly about my thesis and why I think it's uh, still uh, why I think it's important uh, for today is because there are constantly questions to which I believe compassion is the answer to, and a compassion framework and a cosmopolitan framework, and the two together you'll see how and why through this lecture. So uh, we have either new forms of crises that are global or new forms of vulnerability that we didn't have before, or uh, new forms of subjectivity appearing in our societies and no set framework uh, to address them. So I think that today, in the way I'm expanding my thesis is, for example, we have the arrival of artificial intelligence, new technologies, and that's a new form of subjectivity, and the way to address a new form of subjectivity would be an interesting question to look at through compassion. Also, the environmental crisis and our compassion towards the earth that we all inhabit and share. So our common destiny is dependent on nature. Nature will continue to exist, but maybe we won't if we continue with the same attitude. So that, again, is rooted in... Um, in our compassionate approaches or lack uh, of those, um, as well as the refugee crisis, which might be the most horrid example of giving different value to the certain human life, so not valuing human life equally. Um, I'll try to talk about all of that, but I'd also like to hear what interests you more or less uh, within those, what you would want to ask me about, if anybody's writing papers that are maybe about cosmopolitanism, if you were interested in the readings or not. So I sent you uh, the, just the introduction from this book, which I think is one of the books that explains cosmopolitanism well, is an easy read, and Ulrich Beck is a very well-known cosmopolitan thinker. And... Um, First, he evokes what makes a cosmopolitan outlook cosmopolitan, what it means to be a cosmopolitan, a citizen of the world. Is it just the well-off that can travel, that, can have, uh, that have different passports, that can be at home in the world wherever they are because of the education they had and because they speak multiple languages? Is it free trade because goods now travel, uh, money? But the most important, the, the main goal of cosmopolitanism, which was equal worth to human life, and therefore equal abilities and capabilities and rights, 
we don't see happening. So goods can travel, but humans can't. Certain humans are welcome, certain aren't. So how do we think of all of this in realistically, but through cosmopolitanism? And I like to say that cosmopolitanism is a new realism because it addresses questions in a way that have never been addressed within a nation. And I don't think that national responses are sufficient in uh, the globalized 21st century that we live in. So one of the most uh, flagrant examples is the refugee crisis and, and insufficient different responses, state-to-state -state responses, and then efforts on an international level to to uh, pallier ce manque, to fulfill that absence, um, the absence of the state response. So why I talk about compassion, why I chose it for my thesis, is uh, the belief in uh, hu uh, there being more to human existence and cohabitation on Earth than everybody against each other and self-interest and uh, a fight for power and accumulation of power. I believe that uh, all of this is something we've grown accustomed to through a neoliberal discourse of the ideal of the 21st century independent individual that doesn't need anyone that's autonomous and that's the idea of success. Whereas that is, in my belief, a false idea. There is no such thing as an autonomous independent human being because we all have dependencies and vulnerabilities. We are vulnerable to each other within ourselves because of our body. We are vulnerable to the state. Our uh, home can be taken away by war, by poverty. Our nationality can be taken away. So there are a lot of dependencies that there is no point denying and aiming for an ideal that just uh, creates anxiety, creates uh, conflict, uh, that doesn't get us anywhere. So maybe thinking outside of this model of the 21st individual autonomous um, neoliberal and thinking towards our allegiances and our dependencies and first and foremost the shared humanity, the shared destiny, the shared mortality that we all share as the first allegiance could be an answer out of this framework that it, is we're kind of stuck in because we see no no way out uh, yet. So um, if we look at still in these terms, what is happening is that we are creating a center and a periphery. Center and a periphery in the sense of value we give to life. So the central value is the individual that's a, a CEO, a banker, a lawyer, and the periphery are the caretakers, are uh, the elderly, are the uh, those with uh, vulnerabilities and dependencies that, some, that the majority don't have and creating that kind of center and periphery in human life and in human value valuing human life differently creates the situations that we are wit witnessing today that we have grown increasingly more accustomed to seeing human suffering and doing nothing about it to living and therefore accepting this idea that we can just let certain lives die and perish and that there are other lives that require more protection on our part. So like we've seen the most recent and uh, most flagrant example is what is happening in Libya with the actual market of human life, again, slavery in the 21st century. And what have we seen as a response? Would it have been the same if we've seen something like that closer to home somewhere in Europe? Again, like we've seen so many times with Ebola, with many cases, we uh, find it so much easier when it's close to respond and uh, act than when it's further. And this is the problem of our uh, compassion again because it's dissipated with distance. So we can feel more compassion towards the family, the local, the community, maybe the nation, and then it becomes increasingly more uh, difficult when we pass the, the border of the nation. And this is why um, I'm working together on compassion and cosmopolitanism because trying to work out a framework that would explain uh, why uh, we need to respond and have obligations to all of humanity. So because of these different types and levels of uh, vulnerability, uh, we need to talk about uh, the value we give to human life. And that is the basic core of cosmopolitanism, given equal moral worth to all human life. But um, whether that is the case, uh, I'm not sure, because we are not equally, as I mentioned, is exposed to types of vulnerability. So the, the types of vulnerability that are uh, common to all of us are um, 
to the other, to your, in your workplace, uh, in rights that you have that are given to you by the nation, uh, which is interesting to look at. And maybe if you've been reading on Gambit, I don't know. of what happens to a life that doesn't have a state, that doesn't have a... What about people that don't have passports? Uh, what about illegal refugees or immigrants? How can human life be illegal? And uh, how do we say that we live in an era of uh, human rights uh, emergence and equal human rights to all if we still witness situations like the refugee crisis or what, what's happening currently in um in uh, Libya. So we are witnessing this sort of birth of an anthropology of extreme vulnerability and the extreme inability to live the good life. The good life is a term I'm sure you've used in this course, uh, used by many philosophers, Paul Ricoeur, Judith Butler, as in being uh, able, allowed uh, to use fully or all our cap capabilities to live a dignified existence, a life worth living and sustaining. Um, it is often talked about in the context of aid and relief. So if we're just providing uh, nutrition for that day for a starving child instead of putting into place institutions that will allow for those parents to make money to feed to provide for their own child, are we perpetuating, are we solving a problem? Um, so those are all the questions that co cosmopolitanism tries to talk about and address. And. Um, the the starting point could be, uh, at least it is for me in my thesis, the deconstruction of identities that are socially constructed. So as I'm sure you would all agree with me, the for example, the social construct of race, that there is no such thing as race, the social construct of gender and many other social constructs that have created these identities that put us in a, in a dichotomy, in a, us against them, in accepting, understanding, not understanding, and getting back to the core, the only uh, uh, belonging that we cannot de deconstruct, and that is the fact that we all share the same earth and we are all mortal. So in order for that to become the primary allegiance, uh, there needs to be a framework that helps us think through those patterns and not through the patterns of belongings that are only to the state, or to the local. So um, in, there have been efforts, I have mentioned this before, um, in uh, complete, in complementing human rights to explain that even though we all have them officially on paper, that sometimes uh, the realization of those rights for certain individuals could be prevented, whereas it should be un unconditional. So um, the Nobel, uh, Nobel winning economists Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum have developed this approach uh, called the capabilities approach, which is an approach that complements human rights in the sense that it thinks about the minimal conditions necessary to a dig dignified existence. That even though in certain countries officially in the international uh, spheres and dialogue you would think they give equal human rights to all, there are certain parts of the population that do not have access to it, or maybe there are populations that don't even have knowledge of how to obtain certain rights, or there are certain situations of extreme vulnerability like uh, natural disasters, earthquakes, where people can't uh, fully realize uh, those, uh, those rights, and also there are those that are more ordinary and everyday, uh, which are certain physical, mental, or social inabilities to uh, to to say that this universal universal approach to human rights is enough. So that a certain different kind of, of attention needs to be given. That to say is the universal part of cosmopolitanism, but uh, it also is always th thinking within a context. Uh, and respecting the difference. So if we have a universal agreement of equal worth of all human life, but in practice it isn't always the case, then we need to think of why and how and have that dialogue. So if, uh, like I've mentioned uh, with Angamben, if we can be deprived of uh, rights, if our rights only come from the nation, and uh, uh, we acknowledge that that's our fundamental de dependence of, to those powers, then how do we protect that? Uh, what, how do we protect the situation in which the state no longer gives protection, in which there is no state, in which what once was a country no longer is a country or is ridden by war and has no... Uh, 
no government, uh, no one to protect the populations. And uh, this is where we have seen today uh, a rise in need of cosmopolitan thinking, even though cosmopolitanism is as old as uh, Diogenes, the Stoics, um, in the 5th century BC, I think, 5th or 5th century, uh, it started as this idea as inhabiting the world as a whole, cosmos and politus, so cosmos, the world as a whole, and polity as uh, polis, the, the, the city, uh, a place uh, that has its own sovereignty. So that was a, a metaphor to think about, the world, but today it's no longer that much of a metaphor because it actually exists. All these dependencies are interconnected. Um, we have uh, something that in the media is often referred to as international community. What is it exactly? Uh, but it refers to many um, contracts that um, create a community on a market level, military level. Uh, we have, for example, an agreement on the climate on climate change and ways to address it, the uh, Nuclear non proliferation Treaty. So these uh, efforts and the efforts of international relief organizations like the Red Cross, uh, like uh, the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, as well as the International Criminal Tribunal were all instituted to make states more accountable for their crimes, for a crime that can be now called a crime against humanity. So if there is a crime against humanity, if there is a human outside of the nation, if there is uh, right and value that you have other than that given to you by your own state, then it's worth thinking about the framework that it belongs in. And for me, that framework is only a cosmopolitan framework. Now that you will see if you read more about cosmopolitanism, there are different levels of interpreting it. I'm only talking about, for my part, moral cosmopolitanism, and that one that stresses that we all have equal moral worth and obligations towards all of humanity. So now uh, some might think that espousing this would be saying no more borders, no more nation states, but not at all. All other allegiances continue to exist, but they should be secondary to this, um, this, uh, this one. So uh, the, the question is how uh, we can put it in place. I've mentioned some, uh, some of the efforts that have been made. Um, and uh, the, the instances that al allow us to, um, to uh, hold accountable even our own state or other institutions are those that are now supranational, but they are in no way tending towards a global state because as you learn in this case there, uh, class, there is, uh, sorry, uh, there is anarchy in the international sphere, so states are organized social construct, contract, but then between states, it's only anarchy, which we can call, call it in a way because there is no one power above all states, but there are now many different ones. So there are many institutions that are globalized. There are many uh, forms of economic cosmopolitanism that very much exist, but this, the area where we're failing, and that's why I'm stressing it, is moral cosmopolitanism. So. Uh, we have gotten used to live in a time with very strong borders and getting increasingly and increasingly stronger and uh, a discourse that allows us to think that we can afford to not accept uh, human life that is just running away from uh, death and violence and persecution, that there should be some sort of quota. Of course, I'm not saying that borders should be completely open and everybody should be completely accepted without any kind of background check, but the, the idea of the stranger being and the other being the illegal immigrant is what's wrong to begin with. So where I like to begin is to think what has gotten us to this approach that we are stuck in today, that we have not moved past, that we are choosing abandon over, over hospitality. I believe it starts with the discourse that's been mobilized in the media, and so uh, we either have the choice to uh, to accept that uh, that discourse that creates otherness, that creates hierarchy, uh, that's a de detrimental discourse that puts us against them. Or we could try and present hospitality as a concrete res uh, response and not uh, idealistic, but realistic response to showing the advantages of actually trying to accept and um, integrate the other 
uh, versus uh, leaving it on, on the sides and uh, not giving it the, the attention it deserves. So a lot of um, scholars have tried uh, to address this question. Uh, first and foremost, maybe most interesting to you, it's Judith Butler, who uh, talks about uh, the lives, uh, the, the lives worth living, and those that we just leave to perish. Then uh, we have Martha Nussbaum, who talks about the lack of attention, and if shifting our attention and our imagination changes the discourse, then maybe that's all we need. And um, Apia or uh, Urlingbeck, um, the talk about a cosmopolitanism that is an addition to our uh, our national uh, belonging and all our other belongings, and that in no, in no way diminishes it. So we need to think about uh, that even though we don't need a single world government, we need to care for the fate of all human beings, whether they are inside or outside of our own societies. And uh, that in order to achieve that, we need to uh, be in constant conversation. So have the difficult conversations, as he talks about, that are trying to think of ways to make living together easy, uh, to uh, being committed to leaving no one behind. Um, that is the challenges that we are facing um, in the increasing globalized world, world that we live in. So today, this is a, a real need. That's why I call it a cosmopolitanism as a new realism, because it's no longer just a metaphor to think of the world. It's actually reality. We are actually in touch with the whole world. We can contact 7 billion people, realistically think of contacting anybody else in this world, see the way people live anywhere else in the world, and uh, we have the power to affect them to, to change uh, for better or worse. And all the interconnections that we see that are political, that are military, ecological means that we actually do affect each other above the, the nation state level. So now the challenge is how to prepare the minds that have lived uh, in closed uh, small communities with bound imaginary and equip them with the ideas and institutions that will allow us to live as a global tribe that we have now, in a certain sense, become. Uh, to, uh, to, to, to talk about a, a little bit about my thesis, uh, but feel free to interrupt to ask questions, is uh, I, I want to just say that that was the answer that I have come up with so far, is uh, thinking about uh, whether the social contract seen as necessary because human nature otherwise uh, wouldn't have been able to be organized, that the state of nature was a violent state of everyone against everyone, and that we needed some sort of trade-off between liberty and security to live in organized society, to have other preoccupations other than mere survival. Uh, or uh, if we look at it as, um, I don't know if you talked about uh, the veil of ignorance and uh, imagining society. Yeah, I mentioned. Was it? So how, how we come to to live, uh, to choose a society that's most fair, that values life the most, to, the, 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 the situation of uh, the veil of ignorance would be an imagine, like a hypothetical situation like the state of nature, in which none of us knows what we're going to be in the world, whether we're going to be uh, white, male, female, uh, handicapped, uh, and we try and put policy and organize the world in such a way that we don't know our belonging and what group we're going to fall into, and that would be the best way to to organize society. So whether it is the state of nature or this imaginary situation of the veil of ignorance, both of them uh, require a, a situation that doesn't exist, a hypothetical situation that we cannot get to now or that maybe only serves a purpose theoretically to think of the world that way, but now that we are already uh, where we are, uh, the, the choice of the framework for my thesis was to think outside of the perpetuating the uh, the state of na that the state of nature was necessarily a violent state of everyone against everyone, and uh, thinking of human nature as uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau does in uh, Emile or on education, which is a book I would recommend, so J.J. Rousseau. Um, he talks about how 
prior to social contra uh, construct, uh, contract, there was um, empathy, and then he calls it uh, empathy altered by society. So uh, if we have learned certain ways of pitié, pitié altéré par la société. Actually, the word he uses, pitié. And there is a big debate about the word to use pity, empathy, uh, co compassion, sympathy. In different languages, it means different things. But um, just for the sake of today and for my thesis, I'm using uh, compassion. And I'm, I'll be using, without any difference, the other words uh, if I mention two other authors who use the other ones. So he says that because of certain ways societies have been constructed, uh, we have grown to think of the other uh, in a different way than we would have. So we need to address empathy post-society in a different way than it would have been uh, without society because we cannot use these hypothetical situations uh, to work out a framework. So because we know that in certain societies it is uh, more or less desirable to show uh, compassion towards another human being, we, uh, we either um, suppress it or we express it more, uh, and this is something we first learn in the local. <laughs> so this is something that uh, we first learn in the local. This is what um, is interesting in the works of uh, Kwame Anthony Appia. Uh, he is a prominent cosmopolitan scholar who just got the award for great immigrant. And uh, he talks about his family. His father's from Ghana, his mother is British. And he talks about his um, father uh, being very, all his life, very uh, rooted and connected to the local, to his little village, but full of different connections to the world and open to the world. And he says how the local helps us understand certain things like um, we know what hus hostility is, we know how to understand the other, we know what the other person will mean in addressing us a certain way, uh, what danger is, what is the desirable behavior in a certain social circumstance in the local. And within that understanding the local and being rooted in the local, we can add to that local other allegiances and connections so that uh, it is a sort of... Uh, in a, in a philosophical framework, it is first the family, the community, and then the nation. So in the family, if a child learns that uh, parents give it shelter, protection, and it gives reci reciprocity in return, and that is the world it knows, then outside world, first institution it meets is the school. If it's the same in the school, or if it's not the case, and there is uh, competition, there's bullying, there's, again, the lack of acknowledgement of equal worth of all human lives, that is what is going to construct us as individuals. So we are all governed in different ways based on the uh, randomness of where, what country we are born into. And we can see that in ways people manifest hospitality. You probably sense hospitality as warmer or more open in certain places you've traveled to than in others. Uh, certain places the language barrier being more important than in others. And um, I don't believe that there is anything uh, that can that it can explain this other than the way we're educated and we're governed. So I was just using the example talking in another class of the Canadian uh, citizen and Canadians also being raised to be citizens of the world. So what being a good Canadian also means being a citizen of the world. And in no way does that make someone less Canadian or less of a Canadian patriot. So it's an imaginary that's been mobilized in a certain way in one country and that's maybe lacking in another country. And um, we have to ask ourselves the question of uh, how these forms... Is that the next door? Yes. yes. Is that where that's coming from? Sorry. Uh, okay. Please continue. I'll <laughs> so the question to be asked is... Um, why is it that in certain um, territories, not to say countries, because it's easier to use the word territories, I actually prefer it because, for example, I come from, when I was born, it was Yugoslavia, and now it's Serbia. So 
one parent from Croatia, the other from Serbia. I have to choose to call myself Serbian today, whereas to me it makes a lot more sense to say Yugoslavia, but then I might be ridiculed because it's a country that doesn't exist other than in my imaginary. So therefore, oftentimes talking about territories kind of also decrepabilis uh, takes away the, the guilt of not feeling or feeling too much of a certain patriotism or that kind of belonging. And um, so thinking of uh, the territory that that makes us into who we are, the governments, the education system makes us who we are, and that being satisfactory and the only framework for us to think doesn't seem to be enough in today's world. Uh, because we are seeing more and more initiative on an individual level to answer certain needs that are not answered by the state, um, the, what uh, com cosmopolitanism proposes is to address uh, the questions of justice and immigration, which is the other um, uh, reading I've sent you. I don't know if you've had the time uh, to look at it. It's um, by Professor... Uh, David Miller, he is a professor of political theory, uh, also a cosmopolitan scholar, and he is the author of um, National Responsibility and Global Justice, uh, and more recently, Strangers in Our Minds, The Political Philosophy of Immigration. So the, the framework for immigration isn't a framework uh, that it, on which there is an international agreement like there is an effort in the Paris Agreement for the climate, and it's often left to the state to decide, to put a certain quota, to put a certain uh, way of accepting. And we've seen that uh, whenever that wasn't uh, sufficient and people have organized their own initiatives to help, or certain organizations, certain institutions, that already is a proof of an existence of a cosmopolitan mentality, meaning that uh, we as individuals are organizing to palliate, to, to contribute to a lacking in our governments, something that our government isn't doing. So this is already a way of holding our governments ac accountable for their part of the social contract, for not uh, keeping the laws uh, the way they should have been, the laws that should give equal worth to all human beings. And um, our right, like uh, if you've uh, read Rousseau's social contract, our right to protest whenever our side of so the social contract isn't met. So by protest, I mean a lot of things. I mean uh, critique, writing against something, talking, speaking up, I mean demonstrations. Uh, organizations that uh, go beyond um, the, the national border and national sovereignty. So uh, th these uh, persuasions are all about um, listening and interpreting uh, differently um, the, than, than what, what the state has given us, the only framework given by the state. So it doesn't require you, of course, to abandon the state or the local, far from it. It just uh, makes thinking um, in, um, in a more univer universal way also enabling you to be a better local cosmopolitan. So even having uh, impartial sympathy might be practical if you further your kindness to those nearest to you and you act in the circle in within which you can act that's already a cosmopolitan framework and um, the the non-acceptance of the discourse of we cannot do anything because human suffering is so great and the numbers that we are given in media are just numbers and everything is reduced to a sort of uh, vicious circle of violence and uh, dehumanization of the other, that the person watching that through the news or uh, social media is left only with the feeling of helplessness. So uh, to counter the feeling, uh, we can all already act on, on the local, and then there are those of us who, through certain institutions or movements, can act on an international level as well. Uh, the important works that have been done to actually make cosmopolitanism uh, truly implemented today and work have been done by scholars such as Marta Nussbaum, Kwame Anthony Appiah, um, to the Butler, uh, to, to name some of the contemporaries. But uh, cosmopolitanism uh, as, a, as a framework uh, for thought has all been long present. It is just... Uh, I believe uh, in, more important than ever uh, to the, in today's world, and not only because of the crisis, but considering the reemergence of the far uh, right movements, the populist movements. So there is obviously 
that expectation that we could have, have had that because we are increasingly more in touch with everybody else in this planet because of seven billion people being able to see each other through social media at any given time and affect each other in any given time that it, that would naturally make us more open to each other but that unfortunately hasn't been always the case which uh, populist discourse and far-right movements are the proof of so in a way this is uh, uh, an emergence of uh, of, um, of, a, of a sort of um, being at peace at ease with uh, an increased level of inhumanity of the acceptance of a politics of enmity of hostility of animosity and antagonism opposition all of this has become so embedded in our discourse in in the media in politics that we live in a state of perpetuated state of emergency of different sorts of wars proxy wars wars on terror wars on uh, something a lot less tangible and concrete than the way war was led in the past and this all perpetuates the idea that the only role of the nation is pure protection in the sense of security in the sense of uh, the nation's role in the protectance of the protecting of human life is only about actual security and we see increased measures of security and uh, checkups and even when you enter your university today and we believe that that's the role of the state that we don't have room time or space to talk about uh, liberty, to talk about vulnerability, to talk about populations that don't get the same attention, because we are in an economic crisis, we are in a crisis uh, of looming threats of terrorism. So that discourse has perpetuated uh, the focus on that, and therefore the focus on lives that need protection has been neglected. And um, an interesting current that is that can be easily related um, to cosmopolitanism is the ethics of care founded by John Tronto and Carol, Carol Gilligan, and um, in France, many... Yeah. Yeah, John Tronto wrote a book, Ethics for a Vulnerable World, we have Carol Gilligan. And um, the Ethics of Care uh, talks about precisely that how our attention has been um, um, captivated by that discourse, the trade-off between liberty and security, and has been taken away from uh, the value of human life and the ordinary vulnerability in human life. And uh, the, the, they, they stress the ethics of ordinary, of day-to-day -day vulnerability, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning of my lecture, because there are vulnerabilities that we all share, but then there are those uh, that are could be referred to as extreme vulnerabilities or accumulated vulnerabilities. So in a, sen in a time of crisis, we might all share a financial crisis, environmental crisis, but then there are those also who have different kinds of vulnerabilities like um, a physical or mental handicap or populations whose uh, rights and liberties are not acknowledged like homosexuals in certain countries, uh, gender discrimination. All of these, so to say, ordinary vulnerabilities, day-to-day -day vulnerabilities are what the ethics of care addresses in order to precisely draw the attention to just saying that we live in an era of human rights and we all have equal human rights and the U UN Declaration of Universal Human Rights should have kind of put a stop to an equal treatment of humans, but we see that that very well is not the case. So stressing the attention on what's imminent, what's right in front of you, um, a quote that I like by Michel Foucault that says the role of philosophy is precisely this. The role of philosophy isn't to make visible something that's invisible, it's to make visible what's precisely visible, imminent, right in front of us, so close to us that we don't pay attention to it. So uh, rendering visible what has been by society or by media rendered invisible, giving voice to those who are either not in a situation to give it to themselves uh, or are considered less worthy, is the role of cosmopolitanism uh, and moral cosmopolitanism in trying to fight for the equal worth of all human life.
So even if we can never realize fully more cosmopolitanism, if we can imagine, try to imagine a situation in the future where actually all human life will be respected equally, protected equally, even if that isn't to be realized fully, it's not a reason for it not to exist. It's not a reason for it not to be propagated as at least a normative goal, some something to tend to, because if we have frameworks that only give us status quo goals, if they only protect a certain situation and don't move past it, where it's obviously a situation that has a lot of issues and a lot of things to, to, that need, um, to be addressed in a different framework, Uh, then that is, uh, on the contrary, what must become the model, a mo model that will mobilize our social imaginary um, towards uh, thinking outside of uh, the ways we've been taught to think over the past millennia. So the idea between uh, what's realizable and what's ideal and the fact that we will always live in that gap We will always inhabit a gap, which is our practical abil abilities to make the world a better place, to live as a global citizen, or actually obtaining the moment of equal global citizenship for everyone. So the gap that we have to inhabit, how do we inhabit it? Um, this is uh, a debate that brings me back to uh, my thesis director's uh, work on um, a book. Um, he, his name is Marc Crépon, and he is the head of École Normale Supérieure. He wrote a book called The Murderous Consent. Le consentement meurtrier, I'll write it in French because it's not translated. where he talks about how um, if Macrepon uh, he says that if we just accept this state of things and do nothing about it that's the murderous consent that there are many forms of uh, reaction uh, that are not necessarily very radical there are of course those that are that can help us inhabit that gap on our way towards the normative ideal. So he says that how we already prove an existence of a shared humanity is in our moral emotions. And um, by that there's, for example, compassion that I work on, or there's the question of shame. If uh, anyone has already been in a situation to feel ashamed when we see the treatment, when we see news about the treatment of refugees in a certain refugee camp or any other situation where it's not someone you know directly, it's not someone from your local community, from your na nation, but you feel ashamed for that treatment. The reason uh, why I'm bringing up shame is if we feel shame for the whole, for the collective of humanity, that means that there is a shared humanity. And if we feel compassion in face of another person suffering, the same. So those as a positive and a negative draw towards action. And Marc Lepon talks about how um, our answer can be rooted in our moral sentiments towards the other, but that it never should uh, be left entirely to the individual and their better nature, so to speak, that there needs to be institutions that value uh, these uh, movements and that are in constant communication with the population and uh, that uh, dialogue together towards a solution. He also talk, uh, talks about as ways of critiquing um, discourse and imaginaries that make us believe that we cannot do anything about it. So he believes that the role of intellectuals is to write against this. He believes that we all have the right to revolt, like you've learned in the theories of social con contract, when the other side of the social contract isn't sticking to its part of the deal. So uh, the, the problem is only when the public function of hospitality, to go back to the immigration problem, is entirely replaced by the private function, when we are only re relying on it, and that is the problem we are facing today. A risk if we only interpret hospitality as a compassionate response. So we see it as a contract rather than an institution. We see this care of uh, distant human beings as... Uh, missing the necessary repolitization of the impulse to hospitality. Um, so I think it's important to read uh, certain authors that have written about hospitality, uh, like Derrida notably. There are some shorter excerpts of his books like um, On Forgiveness. 
cosmopolitanism, Africanist, um, where he says that in, it is in the human condition, nature, the, inherit, the inevitable need of hospitality that uh, we are all um, uh, accueilli, well, accueilli, accueilli. Welcome. welcomed Welcome. by, by someone or something that when a human is born, uh, we are one of the rare species that need uh, care for a very extended period in order to survive that like uh, uh, unlike some animals we need the care of a parent or parents uh, to uh, stay away from harm to survive to feed to s stay warm and cool so that's already a form of uh, need of nurture and protection and uh, that in uh, he uh, he's known for his play on words and even constructing his own words um, so he constructed the word hospitality and not hospitality, in the, uh, interpreting the Latin word of hostis, so how it can only be and also be interpreted as enemy, what's foreign. There's also a little part where he talks about medicine and the foreign body as in uh, taking a medicine to uh, heal something that's inside us, within us, or homeopathic responses, or the same way uh, how the the hierarchy, the difference between the person who welcomes and the welcomed can easily be um, if I say so, erased. effaced, erased uh, by um, now this is maybe getting too philosophical, tell me if I'm boring you um, about uh, how when you welcome someone in your home, it's a temporary uh, act so uh, then certain things can change if you feel like the person you're hosting is overstaying their welcome so now you are uh, they're a burden on you and it's an interesting play on always the etymology of the world or the word host um, and hospitality and also um, another couple of French philosophers that um, work on hospitality which are Fabienne Rougère and Guillaume Leblanc I won't write it because another book not translated in French uh, they talk about hospitality and how hospitality isn't just rescuing it's also welcoming so the importance of thinking of um, what hospitality actually is, what is it is in its gesture politically and on a, on a contract and on an institution level. So if we just rescue, like I mentioned, the case of providing nutrition for the day for a child that again tomorrow will be starving, what are we actually doing? Is that hospitality? No, hospitality is also welcoming in the sense of giving a framework for a, a envisageable, for, an, for a thinkable future. Um, uh, or a restitution of the past of people who are uh, refugees, immigrants who are in a, in a situation of a suspension of all rights. So back to Angamben, they neither have a past to come back to if the country no longer exists, if there is a war. They neither have a future because in the country that is hosting them, not even hosting, that they're just in the territory of that country, isn't giving them any future they can envision for themselves. So. This uh, question of hospitality um, joins all the questions we have today, starting from where the rights come from. Do they come solely from the state? Where do obligations come from? Are obligations only towards the nation, again, the state, or to the humanity as a whole? And what happens to people in situations of suspension of all rights? Are they human? Can we call a human life illegal, illegal immigrants? And how do we turn that situation around? Because as um, th this is a potentially very dangerous situation, as Hannah Arendt, uh, I'm sure you've mentioned her, talks about in The Origins of Totalitarianism, how uh, reducing human life to the animalistic only is the first step in to totalitarianism. How reducing certain populations uh, uh, the representation of certain population in discourse in the French media there has been, I won't mention by what politician, uh, like dust under the carpet, like ignoring a certain life and families and uh, existences that yesterday had existences like ours that went to school that uh, had jobs into something that needs to be shoved under the carpet and ignored. So the moment we get into that we're all familiar with the history of the 20th century and totalitarian regimes is the moment we're in right now with the treatment of refugees as in some way uh, a human life with a lesser value than the human life that has the protection of the state. Uh, 
So therefore, again, back to the need of a, a cosmopolitan uh, framework in, in addressing these questions. Um, Thank you very much. This is challenging. No way, and then, well. So, <clears throat> you know, I know you said that uh, there is a possibility of a cosmopolitan world is uh, maybe a bit idealistic, but if it could be achieved, whose responsibility? Because it's my understanding that cosmopolitanism requires a certain degree of consensus globally to be achieved, that everybody, or most, would be uh, on that same page of everybody has the same equal moral worth, but I don't think processes of othering are unilateral. They're always sort of bilateral, or at least at the very minimum. So whose responsibility would it be to impose cosmopolitanism on the world? If there is no global state, there is nobody that can impose it. Uh, we have to, uh, I guess, hope for the better nature. I don't, I don't have an answer to that, but I uh, have a good example to give from the book that I just mentioned on the end of hospitality, when uh, people are leaving their countries and fleeing war, and they're crying for help, to use that term. That cry for help isn't addressed to one person in particular. They're not asking France in particular to help them, or you or me, or a certain president of a country or a certain institution. It's a cry for help. So whoever turns themselves into the recipient of that cry for help is the cosmopolitan, is the morally responsible person, is doing the ethical act um, of answering to another human being in distress. But whether I envision that being um, something we can impose I, I don't think that's the way I'm trying to think of more cosmopolitanism. I'm more thinking of how in certain governments, in certain countries, it's more of a natural response, natural the wrong word, more of a an easier response to the other outside of the nation, and in other countries it's less easy. So I'm just trying to see if there is a connection in education and the way we are governed differently from country to country that makes certain people more prone to hear that respond, to cry for help and to respond than others. But I don't see a way other than a global state that it could be uh, imposable. Mm -hmm. Will? So I have a two-part question. The first one, um, so the, what is the question of um, cosmopolitanism and assuming the answer is to try to create a better world, let me say, um, how does that account? It's interesting to hear you talk about the public shame. Um, and this is something we've all thought about for the display store term paper. How do you account for the rise of um, pro fascists throughout the world, it's from Modi to Trump to Penn? What do you do about these people who don't seem to have shame? Okay, so I'll answer the second part of your question first, because maybe hopefully it will get me to the more positive first one. I, <laughs> I think that um, this, what we're seeing, like I said in the beginning, that we might have hoped for this kind of interconnectedness and visibility would lead to a, more, to a greater open, openness between human beings, but isn't led in many cases to far-right movements and populist movements. It is precisely because those are the movements that have um, tapped into the situation, the crisis, that have captured the imaginary by using the enemy. And we've seen, history has shown us politics work in this way, that seizing the opportunity to create the other, the enemy, is always working in and towards something, has an, um, an end means, don't know how to exact, exactly use it. So I often use the example of the territory that I come from. You have uh, the former Yugoslavia, a country where everybody was considered as Slav or Yugoslavian, and then all of a sudden you have countries with uh, increasing animosities, increasing ideas of ethnicity, of religious belonging, something that was not something talked about at all during the existence of Yugoslavia, and then like a melting pot when all fell, fell apart, patriotism gets mobilized, the nationalism, nationalism for the worst, for identifying yourself by what you're not. So whenever we're lacking in giving identity to people and substance to that and value to that identity, it's easier, we've seen that in politics, to define ourselves by what we're not. 
we are not like the other. We Serbians are not like Croatians because of this, or Bosnians are. So the the differentiation, the creation of other, which you have mentioned, is always bilateral, and I agree completely. Um, but it's hierarchical, so there is always um, a greater burden on the one, like in the discourse of tolerance, who's tolerated and who decides who's tolerated. So there is always a burden to think about on uh, who started propagating the discourse of otherness. And uh, one of my favorite things that I still carry with me and always am very careful about what I've learned from Prof Professor Golub is that we should never use lightly we us when when uh, uh, when we say uh, for example an American student given a lecture on uh, foreign policy in 2003 uh, in Iraq we 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 so does that you using we make you responsible for that foreign policy so I think it's very important to think um, about what belonging we're mobilizing when we're talking about ourselves other than the I first person and um, back to try to answer the emergence of um, far-right movements. So if we had had a cosmopolitan framework to talk about uh, the crisis of humanity, which is more people on the move than after the two world wars, uh, if we had talked about it in a different framework, in a fa framework of trying to help, trying to hear that cry for, for help, trying to... Um, accept uh, that human life has equal worth, trying to provide a framework for that life to continue existing. And some, uh, many organizations have done that in ways that are maybe too small. Like I'm proud to say that my school, Economa Superior, has had a, since three years now, a program where anybody who was in higher education um, in a graduate, uh, master's, PhD in Syria can come to France to continue their education and get a 10-year residence right away. So there are a lot of movements that have tried to uh, welcome in that sense the crisis, but the movements that have prevailed have been the discourse that has tapped into, again, playing on the otherness of creating the image of the enemy. And that always um, you, is for some purpose. Now, whether that purpose was, again, back to the liberty, security debate, in order to implement more security measures, more surveillance, in order to make us believe that we need this kind of strong borders and that there are lives that are incompatible with one another, that there are cultures and civilizations that cannot live together. I don't know if it's a sufficient response. Anna, did you want to say something? Yeah, it was. And then John. It was related in the same notion about the far right movements and how, you know, in today's society with increased globalization, immigration, and refugee crisis, that these far right movements are increasingly mobilizing people to be against the other, and that, in a sense, that they do still have this ethics of care and they still want to help people, but they only want to help a certain type of people. And it's like, how do you get through to these? people in these movements that are saying that they will help people, but not the other one. Mm. Like, how do you impose the cosmopolitan idea to them when they don't want to, they put their own limitations on how far they will help people? Like, for example, there is um, currently a talk about how Christians uh, from Syria have been much better helped than Muslims from Syria yes. by certain Catholic organizations that are very well established since a long time and therefore have greater reach and uh, employees and uh, people working for the cause. So that brings us back philosophically to the question of who is the stranger and what is the relatable and not relatable. And um, a book I didn't write in this class, it's uh, Benedict Anderson in Imagine Communities. I'm sure you're all familiar with. So the idea of, we have this mobilized idea of what's similar to us is what we are necessarily more compassionate towards, more open towards helping, so that maybe you and I would help each other because we look more alike than someone else if you were in a situation on distress, of distress or based on religious belongings. So the, the answer is, I believe, in uh, the similarity in in the collective imaginary and in religion. Because oftentimes in religion, the help is towards other Christians, other Muslims. So maybe in a way that there has been that. And then the other part that I think is the one that we can work on collectively is that the national imaginary is the person who speaks the same language. Sometimes it's uh, unfortunately skin color and other social construct, contract, constructs. Mm -hmm. 
um, that, that precisely make that a willingness to help dissipate with distance or with lack of similarity. So recognizing the main similarity in the other, which is the vulnerability, no matter how distant that stranger is, recognizing that the basically the compassion that mobilizes the action towards the other, why is it mobilized? Because we don't have to use neither past nor future. Past meaning a lived experience that we might not have had, we might not have lived war, uh, or future in the sense of an imaginary, how we would feel in that situation. What is uh, mobilized automatically is this um, understanding that a person is uh, ridden, struck by emotion, enable, vulnerable to an emotion, to a situation, in a way that you too could be vulnerable. So when we are maybe with uh, a lot less important situations politically, uh, ridden with an anxiety, suffering from a personal loss or something, and we know how that emotion uh, prevents us from doing so many things, we know in the same way when we see a far greater situ a graver uh, sentiment or situation uh, impeding on the capabilities of a human being to fully live a dignified existence, that that should be mobilized as the only similarity towards which we help the other. But I agree it unfortunately isn't the case. John? I have a few questions. Speak up just a bit. I have too. a few questions that are sort of related to each other. Um, first was you, 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 were, you mentioned education being a key component to cosmopolitanism. Um, in what way would a cosmopolitan approach to education um, be different from the current system of education found in, say, the U.S.? Um, is, it, is it a way of uh, promoting a certain way of thinking? Is it do we um, encourage critical thinking, or is it actually um, the promotion of values? And uh, second question is, how in a country like the U.S., this is a U.S.-centric US question, um, how can you reconcile cosmopolitanism with a system of federalism where you have pockets of sort of somewhat independent governments that can change um, the law of their local population? Um, is it possible to have um, a cosmopolitan uh, framework of values throughout the country like the U.S. Where it's so not divided, but yeah. All right. So the first question about education and then the second about federalism. Um, I do believe that it all starts in education and a uh, US-centric response also you'll find in Martha Nussbaum, not in this book, but um, Poetic Justice, tiny one, interesting read. She writes about um, how the reform is mostly in history. So the way we present history and victory and um, that differences uh, of nationalities is one thing to approach. And the main approach would be the expansion of the imagination through literature, theater, and arts. So uh, she believes, and I do too, that if by reading a book about, um, you read a book about, for example, the Nobel Prize from Yugoslavia, Ivo Andrić, the bridge on the river Drina, and you find yourself empathizing with that situation. You've never been to the place. You don't know anybody from there. If your imagine, imagination has already expanded to peoples that you have, people that you haven't met and uh, situations that you haven't lived, that that's already that educating you for difference and opening your imagination. And she says that that is the role of uh, history, arts, and theater. She uses the example of how in ancient Greece uh, we uh, would educate by uh, as spectators by uh, aiming for the cathartic moments so of viewing a comedy or a tragedy, viewing uh, humanness in all its vulnerability uh, in a funny moment or in a sad moment would allow us to live that situation without actually having lived it and therefore be better equipped to respond to similar situations that would arise in the future. And I'm sure everybody has through literature or arts or movies uh, even um, Sandra Logier, one of the proponents of the ethics of care, writes, writes a lot about television shows, um, how empathizing with a certain character and a certain situation in life that is not ours is already an expansion of the imagination. And she criticizes uh, the lack of identification that has been in the media. You've seen that also in the critique of Hollywood of the Oscars being too wide and all of them. For example, what, what is a... 
a black female going to identify with if she's if her uh, skin color and gender is less represented as the main role as the hero in uh, TV shows and in movies so she, that's uh, the critique on the expansion of that in uh, Hollywood and uh, and in um, and in the sense of promoting values you were saying is uh, that's the Canadian example that I was studying promoting the values of international being good citizens of the world first and foremost and that, that in no way diminishes your uh, you being a good patriot so um, all allegiance is welcome but as long as the first allegiance is uh, the, the one to humanity as a whole and I believe that that will become more and more realistic and attainable because in every country now we ha it's rare to find a country where without any uh, successfully integrated immigrants, without communities with different traditions, without um, those mixing in dialogue, understanding, accepting differences. Um, and about federalism, I think it's a, a, actually a positive example because like in the U.S. you can see certain uh, states going against the predominant uh, national discourse and uh, deciding to respond in what they might, it might even be considered a mini civil disobedience. Cosmopolitan in, California. <laughs> <laughs> Cosmopolitan Californian disobedience in uh, the, their allegiance being to the plight of human beings and the equal worth of human life and not to what, towards what on a federal level has, has been, uh, on a state level has been uh, the, the predominant way of thinking the crisis. What's the name of the book you mentioned before, sorry? The Nus uh, Martha Nussbaum? Yes. Poetic Justice. Um, so I was wondering, what are some initiatives and avenues the media can take to humanize the refugee crisis and close the gap? I believe the number one uh, is not representing human life in numbers and statistics. Mm -hmm. So when we hear that a certain number of people had drowned in the Mediterranean trying to cross I think that is a very, very wrong way of representing things because it leaves the individual watching the many as a number. It takes away all the uh, the uh, intim intim or the the personal uh, plight and struggle of that particular person or family. So whenever there was, and that's proven because whenever we had somehow a personal story come to us through the media, like the Syrian boy, the picture that drowned with his face in the sand, that one picture of one child, and the day before we heard about, I don't know what number of children who didn't survive, that one picture mobilizes a lot more than the numbers do. So I think that there is something to be said and analyzed about media representation of human life in sheer numbers and statistics versus stories that we have time, first of all, I stress the importance of time to uh, mourn and a framework to think. Because if you're just served a number and the fact without a fame framework that allows you how to think about it. And I always say I don't believe this with some sort of philosophical superiority in the sense that philosophy should tell people what to think, but that should provide uh, a richer, better understanding. It usually is said that the role of philosophy is to put words to what we feel, but can't and explain in that sense. So to put that kind of framework to um, to what, we, what we're seeing and to give time to mourn people's lives and to value people's lives through, through mourning and uh, not creating this suffering, uh, the distant suffering uh, that is created by the number representation. Has there been anything like, uh, any successful uh, methods that you know besides like the personal story like of the child that drowned? Like, are there any other like methods that you would think would be successful for them to... Uh, I believe that um, if it's doable, this is a lot of a smaller local level that I've done on um, uh, through, through, through books and stories and approaching philosophy through younger populations. We have done with the book I've mentioned that isn't translated, La fin de l'hospitalité. When it was published recently, we wrote, like a, a colleague of mine and I, the we that I'm using, wrote a, a paper that's like a critique of the book, not in a negative sense, but just explaining the book. And we went to high schools to have a talk uh, with uh, young people, how to call them, yeah, adolescents, about what they think about the immigration situation, the refugee crisis. So there was a lot of... Um, a lot of them that answered that 
probably pre repeating what they hear at home. We don't even have enough jobs for now our own. What can we do? We cannot do anything. And after just talking about this book and explaining certain individual stories from the book and uh, what the, the, the difference between choosing abandon or hospitality, where choosing abandon leads us to, where choosing hospitality leads us to. We've had a, train, a change of, uh, within an hour of talk, it wasn't even an hour, that we just heard, oh, I understand, I should have thought of it this way. Yes, it's not that complicated, it can be done. So I, I really think it's all a matter of uh, discourse and media. Paula. Okay, but uh, on the part of cosmopolitans, there is an attention uh, between nation and uh, world citizenship, other than the very small part that aims for a world state, but I'm not taking that into account. So precisely they all stress, starting with Kwame Anthony Appiah, that uh, being, uh, be feeling belonging to your village, your city, your community, your nation doesn't make you a less good a, a world citizen. So thinking it in the way of attention, maybe if it comes from the nation state, but I haven't even heard of, of that because there are there is economic power in the sense of uh, there are organizations that are supranational that um, work between states uh, that uh, have the power to invest in certain things, to alleviate, to send aid in certain places. So there, there is, um, in the last 50 years, there has been a lot of effort towards uh, institutions and movements that uh, are above the nations and that can act independently. Now, that is still not enough. A lot more of that needs to be happening for, uh, for example, to have uh, the right to appeal to a court that's outside of your state's court. That already is uh, a way of looking at a cosmopolitan framework. If I'm answering your question, I'm not sure. No, there are, there are, <coughs> the, I mean, the, the, the subset of questions related to this question is that there are a set of obligations that that are said to be specific obligations, duties, and 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 and, and rights, as Hannah Arendt points out, rights attached to citizenship, rights to atta attached to the nation state, attached to the institutionalized frameworks, legal frameworks of the nation state. So, and these are, these 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 are you know, the recognition of. I mean, I think the tension cannot the tension between the national and the transnational, the national and the cosmopolitan. Or the, the other the national other forms of, of, of differentiation of that kind cannot simply be smoothed out by saying that you can be both or everything at the same time. I think that's true. You can. But that takes a serious effort. <laughs> I mean, it's not self-evident at all for most people to be both a national, a religion, a this or that, and a cosmopolitan. Now, most people actually have not had the means to, or do not necessarily want to engage in that kind of thing. All right, so. Because there, there's an assumption that there are sets of obligations and links and rights specifically attached to the identity container called, let's call it in this case, the nation state. Okay? There are other identity containers in, in this case. So I, I don't think it's simply resolved by saying that dialectically we can overcome that by saying we're overcoming it. There has to be this effort of education you're talking about, and that demands a sustained and complete you know, rethinking the way in which we present the world to kids. All kids grow up, everywhere in the world they grow up, the education system, they grow up to learn to be little Serbs, little Japanese, little French, little this, little that, huh? Little wees, huh? <laughs> they do, they do, and it becomes very deeply ingrained, huh? very deeply ingrained, so, which is why their hearts flutter when, you know, they hear the national anthem and stuff like that. Even when, the, even, when the, even when the national anthem says, like in the French national anthem, which, which is a terrible national anthem. <laughs> I mean, it sounds nice, but it says, Leur sang est impur à bref de sillon. Their impure blood is going to you know, uh, uh, flow over our, our, you know, our plains. So, you know, and the, and the American national anthem is a, is a war, war anthem. Yes, most national anthems actually are war anthems. 
So it's, you know, they, they grow up to these little containers of national identity. That's what they're imprinted as. To de-imprint that means, in, you know, a very systematic campaign. And of course, political philosophy serves that purpose, which is that you have to start somewhere, right? Huh? I think actually the starting point is the one you always pointed out at, is the we. When people feel threatened, not only that we are uh, educated into little we's, but also the most problematic part is when we feel attacked when the we is attacked. Yes. Exactly. When our state is criticized and we, for whatever reason, feel attacked for that, and the need to defend, even if we not don't necessarily like what's being done, but that urge to defend. That is the moment that needs to be deconstructed first and foremost. I think. Okay, I have another question that nobody has asked yet. Which is, what about power? I didn't get the word power anywhere in this, in this discourse. Huh? <laughs> Political power. Uh, power. Just high, you mentioned hierarchies. You mentioned hierarchies. You said we're close to power there. We're not far from power there. Okay? What about power? Because the, 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 the nature of all societies is that all societies are hierarchical. Even if we assume a relatively well ordered society, who, a fairly just ordered society, a Rawlsian kind of society, or better than that, actually, we can think better than Rawls, actually. Even there, there are hierarchies. Even there, there's political power. Even there, there are forms of domination. Huh? There's domination all over the place. Foucault, huh? Foucault doesn't. <laughs> Foucault writes about domination all over the place. You know, domination is everywhere through the system. You know? What do we do about power in hierarchy? Cosmopolitanism. <laughs> so, we, have this, we have a universal solvent. Yeah? <laughs> yes, after all. <laughs> to one, one, two, well, I just think we need to think about it. Uh, we just need to think about it. I think it's a rare frame, framework that doesn't think in dichotomies. It's a rare framework that <laughs> may be less or more successful or implemented, but it doesn't think in uh, if or uh, hierarchy. And also, I don't know if I mentioned it here in the prior class, uh, Going past tolerance, because That's in thinking in thinking about living in multicultural societies with the only um, moral sentiment being tolerance, we are living in a status quo. So we are tolerating the other without understanding the other. And there is the tolerated and the one who tolerates. Whereas if we are living with compassion, we are in a difficult dialogue, but we are in a dialogue. We're trying to understand the difference. We're trying to understand what we like, what we don't like, to change our opinion. So I think uh, the lack of hierarchy and dichotomy and power talk in, compassion, in cosmopolitanism, plus the cosmopolitanism acknowledge the fallibility of truth. They don't go out in the world saying, this is the only truth and everybody should be acting in such a way. Okay, great, if I enable some different cosmopolitan thinking of the world after today's class or after certain readings I recommend. But if I don't, it's not a, um, it's not a formula uh, that is to be imposed uh, in a way. Anyhow, question. <laughs> Back there, One I saw all the way. One last question, last question. My question concerns education. Um, because it seems to me that uh, if you take, for example, Nazi Germany, um, the heads of the... Let's take a nice example. <laughs> uh, the heads of the, of the Einstein's group were professional people that, that were highly educated. Um, and also, of course, there were the medical doctors who also committed gross crimes. So uh, I'm not sure where education necessarily is the solution. But that was an education in a way as well. That was the collective imaginary, that was the dominant discourse, that's all education. So in Nazi Germany, the education and re-education, for example, of Slavs, was precisely towards that, towards an Aryan nation, towards obedience, and uh, whether the, the parts of the regime that were less or more educated, they all believed to be a part of the machinery, and then there's the whole debate about... Uh, the ban banality of evil, again, Hannah Arendt, and the Eichmann uh, case in which he perceives himself as a mere bureaucrat following the rules and doing his job. And he was, I don't know if you're familiar with the story, he was the one who was responsible for the transport of people deported to camps from point A to point B. And he would claim in his um, trial that he was just transporting people from point A for, to point B, never asking what point B was. So uh, that is a, a case for 
civil disobedience, banality of evil, and education. It touches upon all three because the Nazi ideology was a form of ed educating populations uh, submi submissively uh, into obedience. It was a form of suppressing all for forms of civil disobedience, all forms of different thinking. Um, and also, there has been a lot of the, the banalisation de mal in the sense of not uh, feeling responsible to ask for the bigger picture, to have another allegiance than to your boss and his orders at the moment. So uh, in that sense, I would say that that's the perfect polar example on the other side of what education can do wrong, uh, terrible wrongs, uh, towards one identity. You can educate to hate. But these people. Yeah, anyway, I'm just saying this is a very big discovery. We could, they, were, we could they, they were educated prior to the Nazi. No, not necessarily. Not necessarily. There's like, a long period of time in which you saw this question. I'm sorry, I, mean, I can't take another question. You're right, you're right. Oh, thanks. So. Yeah, I would. Can I just say one thing? Uh, for those of you who speak French and would be interested, uh, some of Arts and colleagues of hers at the École Normale Supérieure run a seminar, which is open to and the everyone. The seminar you get if you Google Soin et Compassion. The, se the seminar is, is, on, is on care, compassion, it's on cosmopolitanism, basically, and its practical implementations. And it occurs in a hospital context. It's not in, the it's hospital is no longer actually a hospital. It's a it's building they used to have as a hospital. But just used in the sense of hospital hospitality, so yes. it's not purely medical. There are lots of people who they invite all kinds of, you know, specialists, uh, ethicists, moralists, philosophers, doctors, and others to to discuss various dimensions of these problems. So you can you can ask. Uh, so you uh, if you Google. So I, I think those of you who speak French might profit from that. If you Google those uh, three words, you get the website and the uh, schedule. And it's Thursdays at 6.30. So if there's a particular, for example, on the 18th of January, we will have someone very interesting I can't wait to talk to, Francois Tadi, who is responsible for changes in French education precisely towards more compassion and less competition. And well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.